Hello and welcome to Algebra 1 Lesson 55. In this video we're going to learn about adding and subtracting radicals. So before we discuss adding or subtracting radicals, we need to learn about something known as like radicals. And before I even tell you about like radicals, I want to kind of just remind you that we saw something like this already. So I want you to recall when we first started working with terms, we talked about something known as like terms, right? So in the case of a single variable, like terms would be the same variable raised to the same power. So in other words, if I had 3x and I had 5x, those were like terms. But if I had something like, let's say, 4x squared and I had 5x cubed, those were not like terms. Those were not like terms. And why? Because you had to have the same variable, which in this case you have the same variable. In this case you have the same variable, but the kicker to that is you also have to have the same exponential power. And in this particular case, you have a 2 here and a 3 here, so they're not like terms. So again, similar to this, we have like radicals. So like radicals have exactly the same index. So exactly the same index and exactly the same radicand. So in case you forgot the terminology, this right here is your index. So this is your index. And I know a lot of times we work with square roots. And when you see a square root, let's say you had square root of 4, the index is left blank, right? But really the index is a 2. Just with square roots, because they're so common, we just leave it blank and it's understood to be a 2. So this is your index. And I'm just going to write a 2 in right there. Now the number, or it could be the variable, that's underneath your radical symbol is known as a radicand. So in this case, the A would be called the radicand. So this would be the radicand. So for us, again, to have like radicals, we have to have the same index and the same radicand. So that's what we're going to be looking for. All right, so in this first example here, I'm going to look at the index. In this case, it's going to be a 2 here and a 2 here. Right? If you don't see anything, it's understood to be a 2 because we recognize this as a square root. Then I'm looking at the radicand. In this case, it's a 6, and in this case, it's a 6. So we have the same, right, the same radicand. And then we also have the same, the same index. So these would be like radicals. These are like radicals. What about something like 7 times square root of 9 and 2 times the cube root of 9? Well, these are not like radicals. Although the radicand is the same in each case, this is a 9 and this is a 9, you'll notice that your index here is a 3, and then your index here is a 2. Right? If you don't have an index, you can write in a 2 or just understand that it's a 2. It's for a square root. right? So the indexes are not the same in this case, so these are not like radicals. So not like radicals. All right, so pretty easy overall to understand if you have a like radical or not a like radical. Again, I always explain this with that concept of like terms because essentially it's the same level of understanding. Once you figured out what like terms were, it was very, very easy to combine them, right, using the distributive property. So when we talk about like radicals, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be very, very easy to combine them using your distributive property. So when we have like radicals, we add or subtract using the distributive property. Now, before I even do this example, let me just show you real quick with something that you already know. If I had something like 2x plus 3x, I know that that's 5x. But at this point, we might have forgotten that we started out by saying that we could factor an x out and write this as x times a quantity 2 plus 3. Right? Because x was common to each. So if I factored it out, I'd have a 2 left here and a 3 left here. So that's where I got this 2 plus 3. Now, if I did that operation 2 plus 3, I'd get 5. And I'd be multiplying by x, so I get 5x. 
So we kind of shorten this process up by saying, okay, I know that the X is common to each of these. So really all I need to do is add the coefficients and then slap an X at the end. So I would say two plus three is five, slap an X at the end, I get five X. Or if I was adding something like, let's say five X cubed plus seven X cubed, I know these are like terms. The X cubed is just gonna be there, right? Same variable, raised to the same power, that's gonna be there. I just add the coefficients. So five plus seven is 12. So I have 12 X cubed. So we already know how to execute that process. And it's basically gonna be the exact same thing with radicals. So if I look at this first example here, a lot of you can kind of guess what to do. So I have five times the square root of 10 plus two times the square root of 10. So the first thing you do is check to make sure that you have like radicals. So we have the same index, they're both square roots. And then we have the same radicand. This is a 10 and this is a 10. So we're good to go there. So essentially all I'm gonna do is add the numbers outside here. So five plus two would give me seven. And then it's times that common square root of 10. So seven times the square root of 10. You just think of it as I have five times some quantity plus two of the same quantity. That gives me seven of that quantity. And that quantity is the square root of 10, right? If I had five X plus two X, this would be seven X, right? It's no different what we're doing here. And if you wanted to use your factoring that you've learned to this point to completely break it down, you could do that as well. I have a square root of 10 that's common to both. So I could factor that out. I would have the square root of 10 and then inside of parentheses that I have a five plus a two. Now, what is this equal? Well, I have square root of 10 times five plus two is seven. So times seven, and I could rearrange that and write seven times square root of 10 like that. So whatever you need to do to make this make sense for you, again, the easiest way to do it is just to think about what's outside of your radical symbol. You're adding those together or subtracting them depending on your operation that you're performing. And then what's common here, in this case is square root of 10, is just coming along for the ride. So what about something like three times the square root of eight minus the square root of eight? Well, the first thing is to realize, remember if we saw something like 3x minus x, we would say, okay, there's, there's no coefficient for x, so it's understood to be one. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. It's, we have an understood one that's multiplying that square root of eight. So if I go to perform this operation here, all I need to do is think about the numbers in front. So three, and then we can think about that as negative one. So three minus one would be two and then times the square root of eight. Now, are we good to go if we leave our answer like this? No, we're not, right? We learned in the last lesson that we can simplify our radicals. So in the previous example, we ended up with an answer of seven times the square root of 10. I can't simplify that any further because what's underneath that radical symbol, a 10 is five times two. There's no perfect square underneath there that I can kind of work with. So I've got to leave it in that format. In this example, if I factored eight, I could make it four times two. Four is a perfect square, so I got to get that out of there. So let's rewrite this as two times square root of four times square root of two. I know the square root of four is two. So essentially what I'm going to have is what? Two times two or four times the square root of two. So you've got to put that extra step in there. We already know how to simplify. So once we learn how to add and subtract, we're gonna throw that extra step in of simplification that we've already learned. All right, what about something like negative two times the square root of three minus five times the square root of three? So I'm just looking at this and really this, right? And the negative five there, you can think about it as plus negative five or minus five. Again, whatever makes you feel more comfortable. But essentially I just think about negative two plus negative five, and that's gonna give me what? Negative seven. And then I have square root of three, that's just coming along for the ride. So this equals negative seven times the square root of three, and there's nothing I can do to really simplify that any further. All right, so the previous examples were kind of the easy ones, the ones you get at the very start of this section. Then you start getting to stuff that's a little bit more complicated. So I have here that in some cases, we will need to simplify one or more radicals to get like radicals. So you might get some problems that involve addition and subtraction where 
you look at them and it, it looks like you don't have like radicals, but then you do a little simplifying and it turns out that you do have like radicals. So for example, here I have three times the square root of eight minus three times the square root of 18 plus three times the square root of eight. So obviously these are like radicals. It's the exact same thing. So they can be added together, but this is not a like radical with anything. I have the square root of 18. That's, that's not going to work, right? Because the radicand is different. But if I go ahead and perform the operation that I can to start, I know three plus three is six. So I'd have six times the square root of eight. So six times square root of eight, and then minus three times the square root of 18. So what I wanna do now is just think about simplifying each one of these. So if I think about the square root of eight, I know I could write that as the square root of four times the square root of two. And this is six out here. So square root of four is two. So I'd have six times two times the square root of two or 12 times the square root of two. So let's write that this equals 12 times the square root of two. Now for this guy right here, I've got what? I've got three times the square root of 18. I could write the square root of nine times the square root of two. Now nine's a perfect square. So the square root of nine is three. So I could write this as a three here. Three times three is nine. So if I replace all this, I'd really have minus nine times the square root of two and voila, we can see that we have the same radicand now, a two in each case, and the same index, also a two in each case, because this is square roots we're dealing with. So I can do this operation now. I would just do 12 minus nine, that would give me three, and then times the square root of two, right? And I can't simplify that any further, so that would be my answer. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have negative three times the square root of five, minus two times the square root of five, plus two times the square root of 45. So as we look at it right now, we don't have like radicals all the way across, but I can perform operations with these two radicals. I can do negative three minus two, that's negative five, times the square root of five, and then I have plus two times the square root of 45. Now I can simplify this guy and let's see what we get. I know the square root of 45 can be written as the square root of nine times the square root of five. So let's write that. So negative five times square root of five plus two times the square root of nine times the square root of five. And we know the square root of nine is three. So let's write this as negative five times the square root of five plus two times, again, square root of nine is three times the square root of five. So what we're gonna find is that we do have like radicals. We're gonna have negative five times the square root of five plus two times three is six. So this is six times the square root of five. And now I can just do negative five plus six. That's gonna be one. So this would end up being one times the square root of five, or you could really just write the square root of five, right? One times anything is just itself. All right, let's take a look at another one. So we have two times the square root of 54 plus two times the square root of 24 minus three times the square root of 18. Now in this particular case, we don't have any like radicals to start. So I wanna break down everything completely and see what I got. So I know the square root of 54, if I think about 54, I know it's nine times six. So let me do two times the square root of nine times the square root of six, and then plus, I've got two times square root of 24. I know 24 is four times six, so let me do square root of four times square root of six. And then minus, I have three times square root of 18, so I can do square root of nine times square root of two. Okay, so put equals here. Square root of nine is three, so two times three would be six. So this would be six times the square root of six, and then plus square root of four is two, so two times two is four, so four times square root of six. And then minus, we have three here. Square root of nine is three, so three times three would be nine. So this would be minus nine, and then times the square root of two. Now. I have like radicals for these two. This one is not. I have square root of two here. I have square root of six here and here. So you've gotta have like radicals to combine these, okay? You can't just combine them if they're not like radicals. I see that mistake all the time. Don't do that. So what we're gonna do is just combine what we can. So in other words, I would say six plus four is 10. So this would be 10 times the square root of six. Can't make that any simpler. 
then minus 9 times the square root of 2. This is all that I can do. I can do no more here, okay? Now, this is kind of similar to if you had something like, let's say you simplified as much as you could, and you had 5x squared minus 3x, let's say. These aren't like terms, so I can't go any further. That's my simplified answer. It's the same thing here. They're not like radicals in this case, so I can't simplify any further. So let's take a look at one more. And if you understood the main lesson on radicals and you understood how to simplify, I think that this particular topic within the topic of radicals is pretty simple overall. So if I look at 4 times the 5th root of 96 plus 2 times the 5th root of 128 minus 4 times the 5th root of negative 8 and then minus 2 times the 5th root of 4, I don't have any like radicals to start. So I've got to look and see what I can do. So let's start with just 96. If I think about 96, I know that would factor in a 32 times 3. Now, 32 is 2 to the 5th power. So I already can see that I can do what? 4 times the 5th root of 32 times the 5th root of 3. And just to kind of save myself a little time, I can just kind of simplify this as I go. Again, 2 to the 5th power is 32. So I know the fifth root of 32 is 2. So I can put that this is going to be 2. And of course, if I multiply 4 times 2, I get 8. So let's just, again, save ourselves a little bit of time and put 8 times the fifth root of 3. Okay, so let's try to simplify this one now. I think at this point that we all know that 128 is 2 to the seventh power. So if I have 2 to the seventh power... And I have something that's an index of 5. Again, you got to kind of think about these things to speed yourself up. I would think about this as 2 to the 5th power times 2 squared. 2 to the 5th power is 32. So I'm going to break this up and say I have 2 times the 5th root of 32 times the 5th root. 2 squared would be what? That's 4. So I already know that the 5th root of 32 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. So this is going to be 4 times... 4 times the fifth root of 4. So now I want to think about negative 4 times the fifth root of negative 8. Is there anything I can do to simplify there? Well, it looks like I can't, but actually I can do a little trick with that. Now, if you think about 8, it's what? It's, it's 2 cubed. Now, 3 isn't high enough to match up with this index of 5 to be able to simplify in that way. I can't do anything with the 8. But I can do something with the negative, right? If you think about that as what? Negative 1 times 8, okay? And then the negative 1 raised to the fifth power would give me negative 1. So I can think about it as saying that I could actually pull out a negative 1 from this. And let me show you how we go about doing that. So let's write plus negative 4 and then times, I'm going to put the fifth root of negative 1 and then times the fifth root of 8, okay? And again, I'm legally allowed to do that per the product rule for radicals. I haven't done anything illegal. Now, what is the fifth root of negative 1? It's negative 1, right? If I took negative 1 and I multiplied by itself 5 times, I'd get negative 1. So I can erase this and just put negative 1 here. Now, I can simplify now by saying negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4, so this would be positive 4 times the fifth root of positive 8 now, okay? So not a simplification in the normal way that you'd expect, but a way to kind of clean it up a little bit. Then we have minus 2 times the fifth root of 4, and nothing I can do with that, right? If I think about 4, it's just 2 times 2. Can't really do anything with that. So I only have like radicals here and here. So all I'm going to be able to do in this scenario is combine those. So if I look at this, I'm going to have what? 8 times the fifth root of 3, and then plus, I can do 4 minus 2, that's 2, times the fifth root of 4, and then plus 4 times the fifth root of 8. And again, these are not like radicals, so there's nothing else I can do to combine or simplify any further.